All right, welcome back. Of course, this broadcast focusing specifically on ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa officially announcing the manifesto for the party, promises basically to South Africans. Whether or not you buy it, up to you, but we have analysts here to tell us whether we've heard anything new. So far, everybody's saying no. This is a copy and paste from previous years. Service yeah. delivery is one thing that the ANC is focusing on. We've heard that before. Sir Ramaphosa also saying that a key focus, and that's the words he used, a key focus is employment. We know that our unemployment rate has been increasing gradually over the past couple of years. So, you know, whether or not we're going to see change uh, this year is something that remains to be proven. So I want to shift gears slightly because we've had three major political parties now officially launch their manifestos, right? We yeah. heard from the Democratic Alliance on Saturday, the EFF on Sunday, the ANC about an hour ago or so. So, Prince, I'll bring you in first to see if South Africans have any hope here, right? You are talking about three political parties that are basically favored in this country. They see the most votes when it comes to the ballots. Has anyone offered anything different to South Africans? It is said that the people of South Africa are languishing under a dictatorship of no alternatives. That's the summary of South Africa's politics. When you look at the ANC, it's a hopeless party. When you look at the DA, it's a disappointing party. When you look at the EFF, it's a scary party. Let's focus on the DA. The DA does not appeal to the majority of South Africans, particularly black South Africans. They claim to do well where they govern, but look at where they govern. If they mean they govern the Western Cape, who are happy in the Western Cape? White people and to some extent colored people. But even in colored communities, by the way, poor colored communities, they are not happy. Africans in the Western Cape, black people in the Western Cape, in Langa, in Nyanga, in Guguletu, they are not happy. So if you look at uh, that province, yes, white people are happy, but black people are not happy. If you get out of that province, the DA in most parts of the country is simply not available. If you go to the remotest rural area in South Africa, in KwaZulu-Natal, in Pumalanga, in the Northwest, especially among black people, you will not find an office of the DA. So South Africans in those communities are expected to vote for a party they see on television. That is a problem. Take the EFF. The EFF suffers from two problems. One, it is a problem of credibility. If you look at what they are offering, they are offering way too radical things that when you listen to them, you think if these chaps were to be given power for one day, they would collapse South Africa. <laughs> so South Africans are scared when they look at the radicalism of the EFF. The second problem of the EFF is this, is lack of leadership. If I were to ask you, Shahan, who is the leader of the EFF in Tuane? Who is the leader of the EFF in Johannesburg or in Pulukwane? These chaps have no leaders at all at the local level, which is why, if you look at their strategy in 2016, they projected their national leaders in the big Gauteng metros like Tswane, like Johannesburg and Ekurule, because they had no recognizable faces in those municipalities. If you were to hand over Tswane to the EFF, who would be the mayor? If you were to hand over Johannesburg to the EFF, who would be, who would be the mayor? The bulk of citizens in Johannesburg, Swane, and, and, and Ekurlen actually don't know who their mayor would be if the EFF were to take over. That is a problem. There is no alternative on the side of the opposition. So as a result, you see that South Africans are disgruntled, but they actually don't know who to vote for. That is a problem. JJ, you, you agree, obviously, with most of that, because I see yeah. you nodding. Well, I mean, you know, Prince is always on the extreme side, so I'll be careful not to agree <laughs> with everything he's saying. However, right? I'm surprised, because you also yeah. seem to be extreme. No, sometimes. I'm not extreme <laughs> at all. I, I think the EFF, uh, one of the things that impressed me over the weekend was their report card. They're not in power, mm. but they were able to give a better report card than the ANC in terms of the things that they have made happen. They may be symbolic and so on, but, you know, Julius Malema had a long list of things that their councillors, whereas they are a minority in those councils, 
were able to say, we made sure they fired this, this corrupt person. They, we made sure they removed this corrupt councillor. We made sure they removed this corrupt... Uh, uh, um, and I would have wanted to hear, uh, you know, uh, uh, President Ramaphosa tonight telling me who has he fired, man. You know, for the last five years, we've had, you know, councillors stealing food, councillors stealing PPEs, councillors stealing monies of the municipality, you know, councils not passing budgets. Who has he fired? I, I'm, I wonder, right? Now, if you, if you compare to what the EFF has, has been able to do, right, whether it's propaganda or not, they were able to say, well, we, we, we exist in so many municipalities, we did X, Y, Z. What is missing with the EFF is what we call a demonstration of concept. They've got a lot of loud things they are saying on their seven pillars. And by the way, I don't think uh, some of those seven pillars are all that extreme. Mm. Remember, some of this stuff is a cut and paste from ANC policies that the ANC didn't have the courage to implement. Take, for example, the issue of land. Mm. You may say whatever you like about the land issue. It's not an original EFF policy. This is stuff that they were t talking about at the Youth League, and they were chucked out because these people didn't have courage. And then when they now left, they said, this one said, oh, now we'll pass the law. Then suddenly they want to pass the same. So I'm not, I don't buy the fact that the, their policies are so extreme because it, it, they, they will be you know, so, sobered up by the reality when they get into government and realize that the budget is only a couple of trillion. It's not 10 trillion, which mm. is what you need you know, to, to take over the entire land and buy it out to everybody, right? So, so that's where I made, I made part ways with Prince a little bit. I think that the EFF, uh, uh, you know, its existence in our body politics has, has sort of, you know, uh, electrified the, 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 you know, the electoral system somehow and has made sure that they, we don't have the kind of complacency that would have been there under a totalitarian situation. On the DA side, the DA must tell me how I must believe that they will govern better if in Tuani they had four disgraced mayors, one who's beating, beating up people, called Solim Simon, he left there, hired, was hiring terrible uh, uh, you know, people there without a criteria, apparently he hired a bodyguard to work in his office and what have you. Then you had Mokalaka who was sleeping with people in the office. It's just a mess in Tuani, right? And then well, I must believe that the DA is going to be better. Yeah, maybe they are, they, mm. they are a, they, they'll be the better devil <laughs> if, if they are better. Yeah. But, but explain to him, explain to me your mayor in PE whose you know, hospital was driving at 11 o'clock in a cafe and was found with tender documents in his car. If you can explain that to me, right? So, so at the same time, I have to give them Bongani Baloi in the Val to say, when I say, here's a, a, a well run municipality, we have to believe when we see the facts that the municipality has had five. Uh, uh, you know, audit, uh, what, what do you call it, clean audits five years in a row. Can't, you, can't, you can't discard that. <laughs> you can't ignore that. But at the same time, I can't ignore that you had four mayors in Tuani. The place was ill-governed for the last five years. So it, it, there may be a reason there to say replace the DA in Tuani. But do you replace the DA in Midval? No. <laughs> mm. I'll, 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 I'll vote for Bangani Valley tomorrow again because he has demonstrated concept. Uh, and like the EFF who has never governed anywhere, they must now stop this thing where they are in the background and trying to push things from the back. They must win and go and govern. Yeah. So there's three sides to every story, wise people say. Susan, <laughs> what's your opinion on that question? <laughs> yes, certainly. And it's fascinating how we see the political parties play to the image of being in power and having shown that they can govern and having done well in whatever respects. Certainly we've seen the EFF in a few cases using their power brokering statuses where, if, for example, in the metros, the, none of the other parties, neither the ANC nor the DA, had outright majorities and depended on the EFF to come in, in and build those, those outright majorities to help the other parties to govern. And the EFF used that power effectively for itself in that it really could dictate to whether it was the ANC or to Ian, to, to all the DA in other places, like we saw in Nelson Mandela Bay at one stage, they could dictate certain policy options. And even if it just benefited a limited community, they use that way to look, to look after their own constituencies and certain parts of the community. 
And the DA, of course, they can say they've been in government in several places, but as Prince also points out, they, they're always, it's always partial and not inclusive government there. So yes, and the political parties play on the power making and brokering, power brokering, and that is where the micro parties, the one or two councillor parties, can really come in after this election and continue building those alliances and coalitions to enable the bigger parties to form their outright majorities and being able to elect speakers and pass their budgets, etc. So here, and the small parties and the new parties. Action SA, for example, those types of parties, I do not see them coming in with major yeah. followings, major results, but they certainly can hold a few seats that can be very crucial in building outright majorities. And they, we have this it's often disconcerting, unfortunate phenomenon that micro parties with one or two councillors punch way over their weight in councils and that they will therefore will disproportionate power and influence. And that is not in line with the voters scope of mandate that they had given to those parties. So that is in, in this context where the political parties play for power and uh, small and micro parties play a big role that can be can leading to very unrepresentative and unaccountable mm. um, councils and council constitutions because it is often backroom deals and bar brokering and just exchange of positions, awarding of positions very often important, powerful positions on mayoral committees to spend money which is probably not there. And but that will be used as instrument to build those majorities and it leads to power politics and advantages to individuals and parties, party persons, rather than to doing these things that we have been told tonight, uh, reminded, I should say, is possible and are desirable in councils, but which political parties do not get around to doing. So I want to talk a bit more about Action SA, Prince. And obviously we know that Herman Mashaba was the yeah. Johannesburg mayor, and then he had a big fight with Helen Ziller and left yeah. in a half. Uh, the work he was doing as mayor was questioned by some, especially how extreme it was. Is Action SA offering anything different, or are they offering much more of the same, but there might be some faith that Herman Mashaba will be able to do a better job if he is e elected? And it's a long shot, but let's talk about if. Look, <clears throat> um, Action SA is not offering something different in the main from the rest of the other political parties. Because the rest of the other political parties are saying they will govern better. And that's what Action SA is also saying, that when they are in office, they will govern better. They will be better um, service delivered. That's what they are saying. So the question here is not whether they are promising something different or something new per se. It is whether they are believable. The other political parties that are there, that have been there, like the DA, the ANC, and the EFF, are not believable. Action SA in the main, I would argue, especially if you look at how they, how Herman Mashaba governed in Johannesburg, they are, to a great extent, in my view, believable. Herman Mashaba did certain things, by the way, that most people are not talking about. Number one, he created, he actually enlarged the metro uh, police in Johannesburg. He created new, more than 1,000 new positions for Metropolis in Johannesburg. He insourced workers who used to be employed by tenderpreneurs linked to the ANC. He gave them full-time jobs in the municipality. I mean, the ANC had never done that. He gave, by the way, one of the things that made the DA angry with him is this, is that he was focusing on giving toilets to the poor in Zanspreit, and focusing on Alexander. And the white people in Santin were angry that he is not focusing on them. So there are certain things that Herman did that makes people in Johannesburg particularly to, to think that if he were to come back as mayor, he would do better. Yeah. The last thing is this. Even though there were allegations here and there, there has never been evidence that Herman Mashaba stole any cent in Johannesburg. He's a wealthy man. There's no reason to believe that he would steal a cent. So he is actually believed when he says, I am not corrupt. 
I have no doubt that if he stole any cent, the ANC's government, with all its might at the national level, by now they would have exposed they would have exposed him as to what he has sold. Yeah. So my sense that Please, let me, let me has a better chance in Johannesburg, yeah. but not let in the rest of the other councils. Can I can I interject there? Do you think that there, there, there may be a an argument made, especially when it comes to the Hemen Mashaba phenomenon, that maybe it's time that you got people who are not necessarily in mainstream politics to come into governing of councils, to come into, if you like, mainstream politics, to bring in a fresh thing. Because uh, what you have seen over in, since 1994 is, a, in a sense, the chip of the same old block. So UDM you know, was just a chip of the ANC after, you know, Holomisa was expelled, COPE, chief of the block, EFF, chief of the ANC block. And then when you go into political culture and all these organizations, it's the same thing, uh, you know, same corruption, same patronage, same modus operandi, right? Would you say that the Hammond Mashaba phenomenon says maybe they, we must go and uh, uh, look away from the traditional mainstream politicians, particularly when it comes to local government, right, uh, to, to try and change the fortunes of our people at that level, Prince? JJ, I think you are hitting the nail on the head here. Here is the crisis of our politics. The people who are occupying political offices in South Africa are not the best of the country. The best mm. of the country, when you tell them go to politics, they say, no, we are not going there. You know why? Because those who are in politics are viewed as scoundrels. So if we were to look at our parliament, for example, and you look at that whole collection that is sitting in our parliament, a great majority of those people actually don't reflect the best of our country. The best of our country in the private sector and the non-political um, uh, organizations. So Herman Mashawa is an important factor, by the way. There's a book, by the way, uh, entitled The Rise of the Outsider. South Africa can only be, be rescued by people who have not been in politics. Because those who have been in politics so far have failed us. Until you get good men and women who are in the private sector, who are in NGOs to enter politics, let me tell you, we are going to get more of the same. So I think that Herman Mashawa is trying to send out that message. That's what I, I mean, that's what he says. To say, South Africans who are good, who are out there, who have made it, who have no reason to steal, come into politics and save your country. Until we see a groundswell of South Africans doing that, I think we are going to, we should expect the same. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, your insight, knowledge, and for unpacking this for us. Uh, Prince Michele and Susan Boyson, as well as JJ Tabane, always a pleasure.